Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Welcome, whether you're in Center Court East or in Center Court West, whether you're at the Woodlands, whether you're online, somewhere near or somewhere far, we're glad that you're here worshiping today. As we continue on here in the new year and start in on a new ministry season today. So take your Bibles and we're going to go to 1 Peter in the New Testament. And if you need a Bible, the ushers will have some in the aisles and they'll just flag, you flag them down and they'll be glad to let you borrow one or, or have one. And by the way, I hope as we go into this series that you will bring your Bible along and, uh, and follow along as, as um, we spend these minutes together studying God's word. So the other day I was doing some reading and came upon a story of um, a lady who was feeling some of the um, anxieties that many people are feeling these days. And so she enrolled herself in one of the concealed weapons classes, obtained her permit and purchased a, a handgun. And she carried around loaded in her purse for a long time, but nothing ever happened. But finally, after about five or six months, one evening after shopping, she went out into a dark parking lot, headed to her car. And <clears throat> she got to the car, opened the door, and found four men sitting in the car, at which point her pulse shot up, and she said, get out of my car. And they didn't budge. They just sat there looking at her. So she reached in her purse and pulled out her new gun and said, now get out of this car. And at that point, the doors flew open. Those four men went scampering off into the dark of night. So she sat down in the driver's seat just to collect her breath and recompose herself. And she turned to just the left and glancing left, just felt shame and terrible embarrassment come all up upon her because she realized her car was the one just to the left of the one in which she was seated. Same make, same model, same color, just an honest mistake. But I think one that captures rather accurately a sense of the just, I don't know, the growing edginess that people these days are feeling. Uh, an increasing sense of anxiety. You, I mean, you just watch the news. There's always news about questions about local and national security issues, diminishing religious freedoms, increased terrorism, um, and persecution of Christians, and the sense that the terrorists are getting closer to us. Um, you have unpredictable uh, imperfect politicians by the room fool who, who are all offering to save the day. And meanwhile, you have close to home here any number of people who are in between jobs, who've been laid off, who are experiencing some real financial uh, worries in this uh, time right now. Marriages that are fragile, some that are falling apart, some that have already unraveled. Some parents, moms and dads, even here today, you're feeling a sense of worry about one of your children, maybe a son or a daughter who's struggling, and maybe you're, there's some sort of a, uh, estrangement, uh, and, and you can't get the contact that you wish that you could have. Um, and then there's the very real worry of disease. And some of you have something. You've been diagnosed with something. And it's serious. And it's scary. It's frightening. Or maybe it's not your body. It's the body of somebody that you love and you care for very much. And you're worried about them. And so uh, we have all of these thoughts and all of these feelings and all of these emotions that are just pulsating through us. And we bring all of these things here with us uh, into worship together. And we sing songs about God who's big and great and wonderful and in control. But deep down, some of us are wondering, is he really? 
Is he really? Because if he were really big and great and wonderful and in control, maybe he could just do a little bit more to help us see his hand at work a little bit more clearly than we're seeing it right now. Well, I think it's uh, very comforting to discover that we're not the first people to follow Jesus Christ who've ever had these sorts of thoughts. As a matter of fact, you go back to the very first century, the earliest Christians, they felt all the things that we're feeling and they felt them even more, even worse. I'll tell you the story before we read from, from 1 Peter because it's, it's a rather interesting story. So you have to go back to, I don't know, right around the upper 50s or 60 AD. It's been 30 years since Jesus was resurrected from the grave. At this point, a man named Nero is the emperor of the Roman Empire. And for all the bad press that Nero receives, and rightly receives, people often overlook the fact that he actually had been a very good emperor for the first few years. He delivered a lot of good things to the Roman Empire. He had uh, been all for sports and the arts and athletics. Uh, He had curbed exorbitant taxes, and so he was getting a pretty good report card. Um, But later in his life, some of his greater influencers, like Seneca the philosopher, retired, and others who had played a significant role in helping him died. And Nero kind of went berserk. And he had this grand idea that he wanted to build a superb villa in Rome, where some of the great buildings of Rome were standing. But to be able to build that villa, he had to clear those buildings out of the way. How to clear those buildings out of the way was the question. So very mysteriously, one day there was a great fire in Rome. And it didn't just go one day. It went 10 days and nights. It got terribly, terribly out of hand and burned 75% of the city of Rome. And legend has it that Nero fiddled while Rome burned. But after it was over, Nero and his lieutenants, they had to have somebody that they could frame, that they could pin this fire upon because everybody, of course, was looking straight to them. And it was at this point that they decided, let's pin this fire on the Christians. That little sect of people, they've always been a little odd. They've always been a little quirky. They've always done some different things. For one thing, they won't worship the emperor And so that was seen as a lack of of, uh, being politically uh, correct, not being good patriots. And take the Lord's Supper, they said, communion. Uh, Isn't that cannibalism? I mean, they talk about eating, the taking the flesh and eating the body of Jesus and the blood. Aren't they, they're kind of cannibals, aren't they? And then the clincher was, that some of the Christian preachers had been preaching that someday the world would be destroyed not by flood, but by fire. And so Nero and his lieutenants said, the Christians did it. So the Christians got blamed for a fire that they never started. And the whole non-Christian world, the whole unbelieving world was irate and they rose up to wipe out these Christians who would have dared to torch their city. This began a terrible run of persecution. <clears throat> it's, not the first per- it's not the last persecution that the Christians will experience. As a matter of fact, it's just the first of nine waves of persecution that the Christians were gonna experience for 250 years after Christ tell you some of the things that happened. For one, Nero would take some of the Christians, 15 and 20 at a time, and he'd drag them into the Colosseum. And thousands of people would be cheering, and he'd unleash the lions, and the lions would tear the Christians limb by limb as the crowds were cheering. And they would take Christians, and they would wrap them in freshly slaughtered animal skins and feed them to dogs and wild animals. Some of the Christians were beheaded something that we've seen happening again in the recent year to some Christians. Others were dipped in kerosene and set afire 
as torches to illuminate Nero's gardens at night. And so the Christians throughout Jerusalem, you can imagine now, they're panicked, they're terrified. The walls are closing in, everybody hates us. Why do they hate us? We didn't do that, but we're getting blamed for something that we, it was a terrible situation. So what did they do? They, they, they grabbed anything they could and they began to flee from Jerusalem. And they scampered off into the hills and they fled like refugees to places as far and foreign as modern day Turkey, just fleeing for their lives. And Peter saw exactly what was happening and he sat down to write them a letter to encourage them. Now when you think of Peter, you don't think of Peter now as the young man, the brash, impulsive, blustery uh, young man who had traveled with Jesus. The one who said, I'll never forsake you. I'll never leave you. Not that Peter. Not the one who said, hey, I want to walk on the water. So he steps out. Not the one that took the sword and chopped off the soldier's ear the night that Jesus betrayed. He's come a long ways, that Peter. It's been 30 years. Now he's seasoned. He's stable. He's wise. He's full of love for these Christians who he sees as his flock. And he sits down to write them this letter to encourage them and to give them guidance on how do you keep hope in these times that feel very desperate and very uncertain. And the more I've been studying this book the last few months, the more I've sensed the Lord saying, this is the right book for us Christians today to spend some time in. And so we're going to spend some time in 2016 going through this book. I think before we're even done today, you'll start to see some of the relevance it's the reason why we're going to take a look at this book. So let's step up behind Peter and sort of peek over his shoulder as he's writing this letter to these dispersed, exiled Christians all around Asia Minor and see if what he says to them might not also apply for us. First Peter 1, starting in verse 1. Peter, oh, I should say... In those days, you would always start your letter by saying who you were. Today, we say love at the end, kin, you know, and so you have to turn to the end to see who the letter's from. It kind of made more sense the way they did it, so you could know exactly who you're reading from. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's exile, to God's elect exile scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. That's modern day Turkey. Who've been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish or spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in the praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you're receiving the end result of your faith the salvation of your souls. Now, there's so much in those verses, and so I want to see if I can distill it for us. If I were to summarize the sermon in a sentence, it would be this. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you may very well go through hell, but when you do, don't despair. Don't despair. Now, there's three reasons. Well, there's more than three reasons, really, chalk in to, to these writings, but we only have time for three. For today. So if you're taking notes, the first one is this. Don't despair. Why? Because, he says, verse 3, we've been born into a living 
hope. Let's talk about that one for a minute. With the words of verse 3, he's caused us to be born again into this living hope. It's as if Peter is soaring high above, cruising along now at 30,000 feet altitude to encourage those of us, the rest of us who are stationed down here on the ground in the midst of our difficult circumstances. It's as if he can see above and much broader than we can see down here. And he's saying, hey, 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 don't forget you've been born into this living hope. Now, if anybody could talk about a living hope, of course it was Peter. Why? Well, let's remember his story just a little bit. We talked about it last spring, and did a whole series on Peter. So I think it's timely that we come back and look at who he became 30 years later. What was going on in his life? Well, you remember he was a net fisherman. That just every day he would get his nets. He'd go out when it was dark and he would fish and fish and fish. Then he would come in when the sun came out and the nets could be seen. And he would clean his nets off methodically and he'd sell the fish and get some rest and go out and do the next night again. And just day after, some of you who are fishermen, you're like, I would love a life like that. I don't know. Every single day, it could get a little old and routine and boring, right? And I would imagine that's how his life was. Just sort of like many of our lives can get sort of old and boring and routine, just going to work day after day after day, or washing and folding the clothes day after day after day. It can get boring and routine, but one day, this man Jesus walks into Peter's life and he says, follow me. And instantly, something sprang to life inside of Peter, hope. He'd never had a person to follow. He'd never had a cause to live for. He'd never existed for anything outside himself and just getting some fish caught. So everything changes. Now his life has purpose. Now it's exciting as he goes off and follows Jesus these three years. But then one day hope died inside of Peter. Why did it die? Because this man whom he'd followed for three years and staked everything uh, next, he said, I'm counting on the fact that you really are the Messiah. And then he dies. He's crucified and dies and gets buried in a tomb. And at this, the walls totally closed in on Peter and, and his hope died. But then, three days later, Something happened that sprang his hope back to life. A dead Christ arose. And when he rose from the dead, you remember Peter was the one who got to go in and see it first. He went in and said, the tomb is empty. And don't you know, if you had followed somebody for three years and you watched them die and you saw them buried and you know they're dead, dead, and you watch them be buried, and then three days later, you see them spring to life, your hope would go ballistic as well because you would have seen the miracle of all miracles, and that means if you can conquer the grave, then everything you ever said, everything you ever taught us, everything you ever promised, it's true, and it's right. And so Peter's, the rest of his life, he basks in this living hope that came through the resurrection. That's where he starts the letter, reminding these Christians, hey, 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 I know the times are tough. I know it's very scary. I know it's very, but you have to remember, there's something going on that's grander and greater. (laughs) We've been born into this living hope, regardless of those things that are going on around us. You've been born into this living hope. Now, sometimes people will say, well, how do you know that Jesus was really resurrected? Oh, there's a lot of interesting arguments, and you buy books upon, read some of the arguments, and we've talked about them sometimes up here, and I'm sure we will again in the future. But for today's purposes, I would point you no further than just to Peter's life. I think that's a great proof right there. You say, how's that a proof? Well, remember who he was the night that Jesus is betrayed and goes to the cross. He's denied knowing Jesus three times. He's the coward. He goes off into the dark feeling like a terrible failure. And the Bible says he just sort of several days later just went back to fishing, said, well, it's just all over. What else could have transformed him into this bold, brave, courageous, I'm done with fishing for people. The rest of my life I'm going to, uh, done with fishing for fish. The rest of my life I'm fishing for people. 
and I'm gonna help them come to know Jesus. What else could have transformed him but seeing the risen Jesus? So he spends the rest of his life saying, we've been born into a living hope. Trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me. I was the one who got to see it, but it wasn't just for me. Don't you see in verse three, he says, he's caused us, all of us who were believers, to be born into this living hope. Not just me, all of us have been. It was as if he was saying, once you get your mind around this, you will be able to rise above whatever the world throws at you. It's as if he was saying, if God could bring Jesus out of the pit of pits, he can pull you out of your pits too. This makes me think of my friend David Chavez. He died nearly a month ago now. I did his funeral about a week before Christmas. And <clears throat> you talk about problems. You talk about pain. Uh, David had a condition called glaucoma. It's an eye condition, degenerative. And over the years, he, he lost his sight. And yet, he and Connie have been coming here for years and years, serving faithfully week after week after week here. You probably might have even seen him. He would wear the dark glasses, and he would navigate his way around using a long pole, uh, that long cane, uh, to, to navigate here at Faith Bridge. Well, in addition to the blindness that overtook him some years ago, he also had a problem, diabetes, very bad uh, and then eventually chronic kidney failure. And he just couldn't bring himself to, to do dialysis. And so his lungs began to fill uh, with fluid, which makes it very difficult to breathe. And so David languished in pain for years. And in fact, I would say he suffered a lot more than maybe any number of us have ever had to suffer. And Connie writes slides alongside him. Just a week or two of what he was going through, I would imagine, uh, might cause any number of us to lose hope, but not David. He always was a person full of hope, of joy, right up to the end. He always had a, a, a ready smile and a corny joke and, and he loved to s s talk about Jesus. He loved to sing to Jesus. And you know somebody loves somebody if they sing love songs to them. And one time he was in my office, in fact, about a year ago, he and Connie came in, he says, I wanna, I wanna play in my funeral. I said, okay, well, let's just talk about it. And in the course of that conversation, he got talking about, or maybe Connie got talking about how he loved to sing to Jesus. And I said, so when do you sing to Jesus? He said, oh, I just, any time especially when I'm having my devotions. Connie said, yeah, I always know when he's having his devotions because I'll be in the other room and I'll hear him just break into song. I said, well, do one right now. He said, praise the name of Jesus. With his glasses on, he just started singing. I thought, you know, that's, that's really quite something. You just sing songs to Jesus he memorized, he said, oh, pastor, I want you to know I'm up to 52 verses I've memorized. Since I can't uh, read anymore, I have to memorize it now. Connie said, oh, yeah, we go through it every morning. He says, Connie, let's go through the verses. And he did that right up uh, to the end. Now, how could he do that? I think it's because he understood exactly what Peter was talking about. Oh yes, the circumstances are terrible. The pain is great. This is not what you signed up for. But he was able to rise above that. Why? Because he was acutely aware. Hey, I have been born into a living hope through Jesus Christ. That's where the hope is. And he was able to keep his spiritual eyes fixed on that reality. That's the first thing that Peter was saying to those Christians. He was saying, you've got to fix your gaze on Jesus. And the second thing is, you need to realize your trials are just temporary. Your trials 
are temporary. That's the second reason we don't have to despair. You see that in verse 6. In all of this, he says, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. Now, that's an understatement. They're getting their heads chopped off. They're being fed to light. You may have had to suffer a little bit, you know, but let's just keep it in perspective. These trials are temporary. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't say Christians are exempt from trials. We would like for it to have said Christians get exempt from trials, right? That's the kind of Christianity that I, I wish existed, but that's not the real Christianity. Unfortunately, there are some people out there who perpetuate that type of Christianity. You come to Jesus, and if you do it right, or if you have enough faith, you'll just sort of rise above, literally, all, all, all of the trials. You won't experience trials and pain and suffering. That's not what Peter's saying. He's saying, oh, no, 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 no. You're going to suffer grief and all kinds of trials, but it won't last forever. That's what he's saying. It won't last forever. It'll just be for a little while. Now we wish he'd even broken down what is a little while, like a few minutes, uh, maybe a day or two. Must it be a week or a month or a year or even 70 or 80 continuous years? Well, he, he says yes. But how can it be all of it? Well, he's... Because he's got this eternal perspective, Peter does. He says, hey, even if you suffered for 80 straight years on earth, when you put that span of time up against the backdrop of eternity, it's just a little smidgen of time. Even though you have to suffer, just realize it's, it's temporary. If you could just get up here where I'm flying along and where I can see from heaven's vantage point for just a little while. You know why I think we have such a hard time with suffering? And I do. I'm, gonna, I'm not saying you people have trial. I, don't, I understand all this. No, no, no. I have a problem with it too. I struggle just like you do. As I've been thinking about it for talking about it today, it's occurred to me that I think the reason that we, especially in this part of the world in America, we have such a hard time with it is because we have been sold the lie that our life here in America should be like we're sailing along on a cruise ship. And we would like for it to be that. But that's never what the Bible says our life here on earth would be. In reality, what the Bible says our life here on earth is, it's as if the Bible is saying, hey, when you were born into this fallen earth, you boarded the Titanic. That's the reality. That's the state of the world, this fallen world in which we live. So quit deluding yourself and saying, I just, I just can't get it. Is this supposed to be a cruise ship? Well, if it's a cruise ship, it's the Titanic. More accurately, we're floating around on those little plastic, portable, temporary, dingy life rafts. And they weren't meant to go forever. They're just temporary, and which is, by the way, also why we are amazed by grace, that God in his graciousness and goodness and love will look down upon us in, in, in mercy and in grace and in pity and see us just floating around in our little plastic life rafts and, and say, I'm going to send you a savior who's going to deliver you, verse 4, into an imperishable inheritance. That's why he sent Jesus to live that life of perfection and sinlessness and die the death on the cross that we deserve so that we could have this living hope and know these trials are only going to be temporary trials. No matter how long they seem in this lifetime, no matter how long they are in this lifetime, I think if we could just get that picture straight in our minds, we'd be able to handle our suffering better than we do. Um, to, to realize we're not, on, I think that's why we, the, we, we, we try to delude ourselves, don't we? don't we? That's why we always want new things and beautiful things and happy things and we go shopping and we'll buy more. And, you know, it just, why? The more of that that we do, the more it takes our minds off the fact, I'm still on the Titanic. And Peter is saying, I got something better for you. I got a better approach for you. F.B. Meyer wrote in one of his books, if I'm told that it will be a rough journey that will lead me to my destination, then every bump and jolt 
along the way will simply remind me I'm still on the right road. And I think that's what Peter was trying to say to us. You've got to get this straight. So the question then comes, well, does anything good come from the suffering? From the, oh, yes, it does. Ah, look at verse 7. He says, these trials are going to be used to refine you, to build character in you, to make you better, just like gold in the refiner's fire. Now, see, he's using a metaphor we're not real familiar with, but what they would do is they would take the, the, the solid gold and they would melt it down into liquid gold, and something apparently happens when you do that, and that is the impurities bubble up to the surface. And so then the refiner would come along and skim the impurities off the top, that bubbled up, and so now you have a purer, hardier um, gold that when it becomes solid again is better than it was. And that's what he's saying. For you who are a follower of Jesus Christ, this is what he's doing. Yes, I'm not saying he's causing it to you, but he's allowing it. And he's saying, hey, the difference is not there's two types of people, the type that suffer and the type of people that somehow don't have to suffer. No, everybody has to suffer. That's just life. There's two types of people. The follower of Jesus Christ who suffers full of hope and the unbeliever who suffers with no hope, who will ultimately be burned to a crisp when they come through that trial. Whereas the believer comes through and we're a heartier, shinier gold if we let him work on us while we're in the trials. Help me to learn what is it that you want me to learn while I'm here. Help me to surrender. What is it that you want me to surrender while I'm here? This is not what I signed up for. This is not what I like. This is not what I want. But I trust that you are good, that you are God, that you love me and that you're allowing it. And so do the refining that you want, that you need to do in me so that I'll become a better form of gold than I was before the trial. Two years ago, one of our sons experienced something that Suzanne and I had never experienced. In our wildest imaginations, weren't expecting it. One of our boy's teachers died in the middle of the school year. And we got that notice, and of course that was a shock and brought tears that evening. And, and you know, it, but the story got worse because the next day, uh, right before 5 p.m., I was, uh, or maybe at 6 p.m. before the news, I was um, looking at my phone, and Suzanne was there in the same room, in the or in the kitchen, and but we were together, and we we both start reading this same email that came from the school and the school said we felt that you should hear it from us first before it comes on the news this evening the cause of death for your child's teacher was domestic violence she was shot by a relative and killed i said oh my gosh are you reading this she's like oh my gosh yes and we both looked at each other like how do we tell a little guy, a, his teacher, God, that's just more evil than you should have to lay on a little guy. And right then he comes walking around the corner and he sees the angst that we're feeling and nonverbal is giving us away. And he comes around the corner and he says, what? Is it about me? Is something wrong? <laughs> At which point we said, son, you just need to come over here, sit down here. And we explained to him what we had just read. And I'm telling you, the sobs that came out of his soul for the coming weeks, uh, we sobbed with him. And he would ask, why? Why? Why did that have to happen? And he named one of his little stuffed animals after the teacher. And every night we'd tuck him in bed, he would hold that little stuffed bear and he, he, he would just sob even after we'd tucked him in and prayed and all. He'd just have to sob himself to sleep for about a month. Well, fast forward two years. The other night, Suzanne and I were talking and just sort of assessing where our boys were and what's going on in their lives and progress they've made and so. And just typical parent talk. And, <clears throat> but then Suzanne, particularly about this son, harkened back to particularly this experience. 
And she said, you know, as terrible as that whole thing was, I really think that became a key turning point in his life. And from it, character was formed. He's developed more perseverance. Have you noticed that? He's a perseverer. I think God really used that in the development of our son, and I couldn't deny it. Now, that says, that's a personal experience, obviously, and says nothing of the pain that anybody else from that experience had to go through, certainly not the family, which I can't make any comment to because I don't know the family. And the last thing that I would want is for anybody who ever got, heard this message, who knew that situation or knows the family, to think that I was somehow trying to capitalize on, on their pain for our gain. Not at all. But by virtue of the fact that their pain necessarily became our pain, I can just illustrate our own personal story has borne out what Peter was saying here. Uh, of course, you're going to go through trials. Even your children are going to go through trials. You wish they didn't have to. But God uses those. Think of it as you're the gold being melted down. The impurities are going up. They're being skimmed off. You're becoming a better, stronger, hardier, shinier gold because of it. And remember, he goes with you. Though you pass through the fire, Isaiah 43 says, you'll not be burned. You'll not be set ablaze. He says, I'm, I'm going to go through this with you. And he illustrated it by going to the cross. There's not a greater furnace than that. But then the question arises, but what if this, this trial, what if this situation, this illness, this disease, this suffering, this whatever it is, the, the, the tragedy that I'm going through, what if it really does kill me? I mean, it might literally kill me. Well, it might. But eventually, something's going to kill every, all of us. I mean, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, none of us will be here. Right? Death will claim 100% of us. That's a guarantee. But Peter's telling us something. Let's, let's get back to what he's saying. He's saying, don't despair, regardless of what's going on around you. Why? Because you've been born into this living hope, because our trials are temporary, and number three, because this isn't the end. This is not the end. What you're going through now, he was saying, even if it kills your body, it won't kill your soul. Don't you realize? And your soul is the real you inside your body. That's the eternal you. The trial won't kill your soul. Not if you're in Christ. Not if you have this living hope. Not if you're fixed upon him. It won't kill your soul. He says, I'm going to protect that, verse 9, until you receive the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So until that day comes, whatever happens, however bad it is, however painful it is, however tragic it is, just remember, this isn't the end. So my best friend growing up, his name was Paul. And I can't number the afternoons that Paul would come over to my house after school or I'd go over to his house and Many of weekend, Friday nights, would sleep over at his house or my house, one or the other. His mom would give us our allergy shots on Fridays, and, or my mom would give us our allergy shots on Fridays, I remember. But one day in fifth grade, Paul had a seizure. And they told us at school, and everybody was concerned, but I began to cry. And they took him to Texas Children's and they got the doctors and everybody working on him and they thought maybe it's going to be okay and better. And, but then he had another seizure and another seizure and another and another and another. And none of the epilepsy, epilepsy medicines were working. And he continued to have all of these seizures. And he began to miss days of school and weeks of school and months of school. And he was falling very much behind 
in fifth grade and then in sixth grade and he was just falling terribly behind but that was the least of his, his concerns. The, the greater of the concerns was these seizures are out of control, grand mal seizures and he was just having, I mean he had thousands upon thousands of these seizures and over the years it, it really began to take a toll on his body and you could just see the wear and tear the degeneration just on his face, in his hair, just in his posture, in his, in his body. He was not the same person that he had been. And today he repeats himself over and over, exhaustingly. And he stutters a lot. And it's hard not to notice when you're with him that um, he's got some conspicuous social um, challenges. He struggles in that way in many ways. But thankfully, um, he has a day job at the Brookwood community out in Brookshire, and he works on the, the crafts that they sell at Christmas time. And um, Well, Paul and I have stayed in touch through all the years. His parents tell me I'm the only childhood friend um, who stayed in touch. But we always had uh, April birthdays. And so every April, I drive down and pick him up and we go to, and sometimes at Christmas too, we go to have dinner and he loves hamburgers. And so um, we often go to the Pappas Burgers on, on Westheimer. And <clears throat> whenever we order, he's, you can always count on two things that are gonna happen. One, he's gonna get very specific instructions about a mayonnaise. And two, he always puts his hand up on my shoulder and says to the server, Kenneth and I, have been best friends since we were little babies in the cribs. And the server typically looks at me, and I confirm it's true. <laughs> well, last year, we were at the Pappas Burgers, eating our burgers, celebrate our birthdays, and I don't remember how the conversation got there, but we began talking about death. And in a moment of shining clarity, I do remember exactly what he said, right in between bites. He said, oh, but Kenneth, for believers, death just means we finally get our new bodies from the Lord. And I looked at him and I realized he didn't even catch the significance of what he said as he kept eating. But I certainly did. And at which point I cleared the lump out of my throat, and I said, that's right, Paul. For believers, that death just means that's finally the day that we get our new bodies from the Lord that'll work just right, just the way God always intended, right, Paul? That's what Peter was saying to those Christians. He was saying, hey, I know it's bad right now, I know it doesn't make sense right now. It's scary. It hurts. But keep in mind, this is not the way it ends. Your trials are temporary. You've been born into this living hope. And someday he's going to come and take us to that imperishable inheritance. And so what he was saying is, hey, keep in mind, Christian. He was saying it to the Christian 2,000 years ago, and he's saying it to the Christian today. You're not headed for a hopeless end. You're headed for endless hope. So keep your mind on Jesus. Fix your mind on Jesus. Put your heart on Jesus. Fix your heart on Jesus. Because that is how you keep hopeful in desperate, uncertain times. Amen? Amen? I think we should go to the Lord in prayer. Why don't we just spend a moment right now. If you feel comfortable and you're able, you can just slide down into a kneeling posture, leaning on the chair in front of you. If you can't do that, maybe you can just lean forward, put your elbows on your knees. And why don't we just have a few moments of, of prayer? Well, Lord, thank you for the hope that is ours and for the relevance of this book that we're gonna be looking at, studying, here in 2016. It's almost as if you just wrote it for us right now, even though the first recipients 
situation was in some ways even much worse than ours. What a timely word it is for us today. Lord, our prayer is, first of all, that you would help us to put our eyes and our minds and our hearts on you, the giver of our living hope. If you're here today and you've never opened up your heart in the first place to Jesus, then I think that's the the moment of, you should use this moment of silence right now just to open up your heart and say, Jesus, I'm asking you to come in and to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me and to give me this living hope. The same hope that you gave to Peter when his life was just rolling along in such a routine, boring sort of way, but you transformed him, and certainly you double transformed him after the resurrection, and that's our hope. Why don't you open up your heart to him even now? And others of us, we say, well, I, I've done that. I've opened my heart to Jesus, but maybe you haven't thought about it. You know, the gospel isn't just something that you just do once, Well, I mean, yes, you are saved once in that moment of justification. But we have to gospel ourselves over and over and over every day. Why? Because there's so much bad stuff in the world. And we need to go back to the gospel every day and remind ourselves of what Peter was saying. That we have this living hope and step into that again and live into that. And maybe that's what you need to do right now in this moment of silence. Why don't you just do that? And then any number of us are carrying big burdens, heavy burdens, scary burdens, health burdens, children's burdens, all the things we talked about at the start. Why don't you now just bring that worry, that concern, that fear, that anxiety, that problem, that burden, that tragedy, would you just lift it up to him right now Remembering that he's the giver of this living hope. Why don't you just say, Lord, I need you to carry this. I don't have the strength. And hear him say, you don't have to. I'll carry it. And I'm going to carry you through this fire. Why don't you talk with him about that right now? And last of all, I think many of us all too often forget the reality that God is for us. He loves us. Why else would he have sent Jesus? If he wasn't for us, he would have never sent Jesus. He'd have let us die in our sins. But he says, no, I love you. That's why we call it good news. So don't ever mistake in the fact that you're going through a hardship or a tragedy or a trial for his lack of love. No, no, he loves you. Just even now, in light of what we've talked about, and what he's reminded us through his word about the gold and the refining and all that's happening, why don't you just let him speak to your soul right now and hear him say, it's true, I love you. Regardless of what it is that you're going through, don't forget it. I'm here. I said I'd never leave you nor forsake you. And I do love you. Thank you, Lord, for this word that you've given to us. Thank you for First Peter. I'm already excited about what we're going to talk about next week. Won't you help us, though, this week to keep our minds on the thoughts 
that you've spoken to us through your word here. Help us to keep our hearts and minds fixed on you, the giver of our living hope. We pray it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello, my name is Adam McIntyre, and I am here with Pastor Ken Warline, who just finished the first part of the Rise Above series, uh, which is going through the book of First Peter. Thank you so much, Pastor Ken, for being here sure. with us today. So uh, we got some good questions in, and the first one uh, is kind of a theology question. Um, they were asking, if Jesus defeated death on the cross, then why is it that we still die? Why is death still a thing? Sure. Well, of course, I guess you could back it up and say, why is evil still a thing? Why is pain still a thing? Why is sin still a thing? Um, because death is just the cumulative uh, pack, packed punch of all of that. Right. At, at, it's the worst right. that life can give us this side of heaven. Well, I, and I think the answer has to come to borrow some phrasing from smarter theologians than the two of us. Uh, it has to do with the fact that we're living in the already, mm -hmm. not yet, okay. of the gospel. So the already is Christ has come, he's been raised, we're raised to life with him. That has already happened. Right. We've been saved, we have stepped into this living hope, we've been justified uh, by our faith through his grace. But the consummation hasn't yet happened. Right. That's the not yet. And so when does that get to happen? Well, in that final day, we don't know when that's gonna happen. And Jesus said, you spend your time trying to figure out when that's gonna happen, because that's gonna happen when it happens. Right. And he knows, uh, only the Lord knows when that's gonna happen. So we live in this in-between time um, that they, the theologians call the already, not yet. And th so that means that we have these moments of uh, life where we're just shining full of hope and we just almost feel like we can see and taste heaven. Sometimes when you go to a beautiful place, you see a sunset or a mountain range or, or you have a special moment with your spouse or children or something and you just feel like you're just almost there, right. but you're not there. Right. Um, and then you have moments of death and suffering and mm. funerals and pain and you realize, no, we're not there. Mm. Uh, it has already happened that we've been saved, but it hasn't yet happened that we're um, all, all the way there, the, the not yet of the gospel. Right. So we live in this awkward in between time. I love that, the already, but not yet, like Jesus came and he inaugurated his kingdom. That's right. It's here, it's already here, but it's not yet fully established. That's right. That's one of the things that we're- Well, that's our job, Absolutely. is to help his kingdom be spread here on earth. Absolutely, already, not yet, I love that. And so another question that was given to us was, what can we practically do um, to help us persevere through um, through our trials, if, if we're in the midst of that right now and we're trying to cling on to that hope sure. um, that we have in Jesus, what are some practical things that we can do to help us cling on to that hope? Yeah, well, this is kind of exciting because this is actually where we're, we're gonna go right into the next section next Sunday. Okay. And he's going to say, therefore, in light of all the stuff we just talked about today, get your mind in gear. He's, he's going to say, you you can't just be cavalierly going along and ah, la di da whatever your thoughts are and, and the, he said no 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 you've you've got to really harness your your mind and your thoughts. I think one of the best answers to the question that you just raised, Adam, is probably modeled was modeled by David Chavez in the first illustration I told. Um, the, the blind man and the diabetes and the lungs filling up. And yet he disciplined his mind and he spent hours 
memorizing God's word mm -hmm. and he would sing his songs of devotion to the Lord. And some of us maybe say, I don't know that I really quite feel like I'm a sing my songs, but you can still be spending time in the word and talking with him and praying and communing with him. And I think this is where the, the devotional life takes on a whole new dimension. Right. We tend to, because we're busy American people and we think ourselves so important that those of us who follow Christ, we say, oh yes, well, I have gotta pack a little devotional time into my already busy list of things to do so I can check that off right. and get onto the stuff that really matters. I think we have to flip that mm -hmm. and say, no, this is the thing that matters. Right. This is what connects me to the not yet is my time with the Lord and getting my mind focused on Him, not on the pain, not on the suffering, not that it's not real, it's very real, sure. but saying, I'm going to step with you, Peter, up to 30,000 feet elevation, and I'm going to try to take that perspective um, that you were trying to give us uh, here in the book. I think that really gives a whole new dimension to the seriousness and significance of a meaningful, vibrant devotional life. Absolutely. When you see somebody like we saw in David who lived with such impressive hope and joy and that smile and, and even though he was in pain. Right. The, and I regularly thought to myself, you are a wimp of myself <laughs> and you need to look at him and learn from him um, because he's setting a great example for when we're going through pain and Absolutely. suffering. Absolutely. So having, getting our minds in gear, yeah. as Peter says, and, and uh, gaining that eternal perspective, right. as you mentioned in your sermon, just helps us to, um, I think it even helps with the fear of it as well. The sure. more and more um, we, kind of, we see the world through the lens of Christ, the more and more fears of um, going through those trials and even sure. the fear of death um, dissipate, begins to go away. Yeah, well, because... Your brain can't think, you can't focus on two things at the same time. Right. Our brains cannot do that. So I'll either be obsessed with the pain, with the tragedy, with the evil, with the hate, uh, with whatever it is, I'll be obsessed with that and God will therefore necessarily have to shrink way back right. and become very little big, uh, little, while well, these are big. Mm -hmm. Or I can put my mind on the Lord and remember this is not how it ends. This is temporary and let him be magnified as the psalmist would say. And as we magnify him and make him great in our minds and in our hearts, because he already is great, but in our hearts and minds, we're, we're adjusting to this reality. Right. Then the trials and the pains and the evil and the hate and everything, it becomes smaller. Absolutely. Because our minds can't make two things great at the same time if they're opposites. Absolutely. More and more we focus on the hope that we have in Christ. There it is. The more that fear dwindles and goes away. Very beautiful. I'm excited to hear more about that next week as well. Well, me too. I'm excited to, to preach it. It's, it's a very, it's obviously, it's set my soul uh, afire again to be studying it. And uh, so I'm looking forward to it also. <laughs> me too. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Ken, for being here with us. And thank you all for tuning in. We will see you all next week. Thanks for joining us for PostScript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.